Hello, and welcome to the Nutrition and Life Podcast. This is where we look at various nutrition and fitness-related topics through the lens of application. We want to give you practical takeaways so that you can create your healthiest, best self backed by knowledge. Now, on to the episode with your host, Coach Lisa. Hello and welcome back to the Nutrition and Life podcast. My name is Lisa, I am your host, and today we're going to talk about seven steps that you can take in order to optimize your hormones. Before we get into the episode, if you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe, share it on your social media, it's the best way to help me grow, and if you have any feedback, comments, suggestions, don't ever hesitate to contact me. But let's dive right in. So why do I want to talk about hormones? Well, again, it's a topic that affects every single one of us. Hormones are the chemical messengers that help our brain communicate with the body. So examples for these hormones would be estrogen, testosterone, thyroid hormone, cortisol, prolactin, and many, 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 many more. So As you can probably tell from these names, they are very much involved in your health, in your overall well-being, how you feel, but also how you sleep, your metabolism, so what you look like, your hunger, your satiation, your muscle growth, of course, if you're able to reproduce, and so on. This is a topic very important to me because I have been struggling with hormone hormone health, hormone balance for many, many years, and it's still something that I'm very much focused on and working on with myself, but also something that I do pay attention to with all my clients because, again, it's involved in literally everything that we do. If people say, oh, I'm so hungry all the time, you know, this could be a sign for something with your hormones going on also. And even if it's just for a sign for cortisol being really high, so stress being really high. Uh, Or of course, if people are trying to get pregnant, if people have very irregular cycles, etc. All things that we can look into. Um, And for me personally, I never used to have issues up until the point that I did shift work compared or combined with excessive training and um, in general very very poor stress management and of course and very little sleep because of the shift work. Since then I basically stopped um, not working night shifts about uh, six years ago and uh, other like late and early shift probably um let me think, five years ago. So anyway, it has been several years. And nonetheless, my circadian rhythm and my hormones in general are still very sensitive or so much more sensitive to anything that I do and a lot less resilient to anything that I do than they were beforehand. And a lot of people that um, experience some sort of extremes with hormones or HPA excess dysfunction and just generally um, stress overwhelm on the body, um, they often for years and years, if not forever, um, are a lot more sensitive or their body is less forgiving than what it was earlier on, which makes sense. You know, your body is just programmed programmed to um, keep you alive and therefore it has learned from previous experiences. So in any case, let's get into the seven steps that I do want everybody to focus on or I would like people to focus on if they're interested in in improving their hormone health. The first one that we should start with is eating the right amount of calories. If you are consistently in a calorie deficit or if you are consistently way overeating and also way overeating crappy food, but it doesn't even just have to be crappy food, just in general, having excessive amounts of body fat is actually a stressor on the body and so is constant constantly be, being in a calorie deficit that is why we do say on average you should not be in a calorie de- calorie deficit for longer than about a third of the year. I realize that some people that have a large weight loss goal, they might be in a calorie deficit for longer than that, and that's usually fine. But that is also why we continue to monitor biofeedback all the time. So basically keeping an eye on your mood, your anxiety levels, your sleep, your like all of these sorts of things that could be an indicator that it would be best for us to go into a maintenance phase for a little bit longer or in between your dieting bricks essentially. And we should also always consider that a lot of people that are in prolonged diets, they might have refeed days on the weekend, they might have 
a week where they were going on holiday and they probably ate, ate a little bit more and so on. So in the end, they add up um, or that account counts towards your maintenance time as well. Sometimes I've had people saying, oh, I heard you say you shouldn't be in a calorie deficit for longer than a third of the year, but we've been in this calorie deficit for, you know, eight months or whatever. And then I point out to them that they were actually on vacation, that on the weekends they usually weren't adherent and so on. So, you know, that doesn't count towards a calorie deficit. I'm just mostly emphasizing this because I also know there are other people on the en other end of the spectrum that basically go from diet to diet to diet on top of over-exercising. And that is, of course, the worst combination for our hormones. In many cases that can, and many female cases that can lead to a loss of period as well, um, used to be known as the female athlete triad, but it's really not just limited to females. Men can also have, you know, extremely low testosterone levels because of under eating and not, uh, and overtraining, etc. So, um, it's, it's, recognized as a different condition these days and definitely as an official condition as well like many physicians nowadays are aware of that and um, will ask you about your training and overall diet um so right amount of calories uh when i say maintenance as i have mentioned in some of the previous podcasts i mean you can go uh you can simply go online and use one simple calorie calculator that doesn't mean that it's absolutely correct. These calorie calculators won't know your current body fat percentage. They won't know your dieting history, etc. But it could be just an, a very, very rough indication to learn where your calorie maintenance is actually at. For many people, it's somewhere around about 15 times their goal body weight in, um, in pounds. So for example, if you weigh 130 pounds you would multiply that by 15 and that could be like roughly the lower end of your maintenance this is of course a super super um rough estimation there are many more a lot more sophisticated um formula such as the Harris Benedict formula which that's probably my favorite I do usually use a combination of two three different formulas in order to determine a rough calorie maintenance for clients of course the other way to go about finding out what your calorie maintenance is, simply eating what you're currently eating, tracking that for seven days, taking the weekly average, and also tracking your daily weight at the same time. If your daily weight roughly stays the same, then divide the that calorie total by seven, as mentioned, and you should have, you know, the amount of calories that you needed in order to maintain your weight for the week. Moving on to point number two, aside from eating enough food or not too much food, <laughs> um, we also want to make sure that we are consuming enough healthy fats. Why? Because particularly the cholesterol in the healthy fats, in the fats, is involved in hormone production. So if you constantly under eat fats, healthy fats in particular, you are going to struggle with your hormone production, primarily your sex hormones, but also the other hormones actually. So many people that prepare for a bodybuilding show or that are in prolonged periods of um, a calorie deficit uh, combined with combined with low fat. So it's, especially in the bodybuilding space, it is and used to be very common to just, you know, eat everything low fat and just chicken breast and rice and broccoli without any fat whatsoever. And many, I mean, oftentimes just because the calories are so low, people lose their period and have hormonal issues. But of course, the lower fat just exacerbate that. So on average, we want to make sure we want to try to keep your total fat consumption at about 25% of total calories or higher. Or you can also calculate that by taking about a third or 30% of your goal body weight in grams. So if your body weight is 120 pounds and we say 30% of that, then, you know, that would be about 40 grams roughly. Am I getting this right? Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. Um, but so that should be about the minimum. Of course, there might be times where you have to drop that a tiny bit lower if you have performance goals, etc. But just given, go by that as like your rough baseline. 
then of course the quality of fats does matter. The quantity is the most important thing, but the quality does matter. And so we have four different types of fats. We have trans fats, we have saturated fats, we have monounsaturated fats, and we have polyunsaturated fats. The trans fats are the fats that we want to limit completely. They are usually present only in or almost only in processed stuff. So for example, the cookies that you purchase or the frozen pizza, etc. This is um, chemically engineered for the most part and in order to make things last longer. However, these trans fats are really not beneficial for health whatsoever. They contribute to um, heart diseases and other things. So these are the ones that we want to minimize. I'm not trying to demonize anything here. You know, if on occasion <laughs> you have your frozen pizza or a piece of brownie that you're not gonna die from that most likely. But if it's something that you consume on a daily basis, not so great. So trying to cut those out as best as we can. Then moving on to the saturated fats, which are uh, highly debated, <laughs> have gone from being terrible and the root of all evil and definitely being the cause of heart disease, etc., um, to being incredibly healthy and everybody pouring tablespoons of coconut oil and butter and whatnot into their coffee and people um, just consuming it on ends, especially many people nowadays in the keto space, they just can't get enough of the saturated fats. However, current research really is pointing towards the direction or in the direction that saturated fats have some healthy qualities, but also still should be moderated uh, in the sense that it should not contribute to more than about 20% of your daily fats. So let's say if your total fat goal is 60 grams, then technically or ideally you shouldn't get more than 12 grams of, um, or not more than 12 grams of those should be from saturated fats. So a little bit of grass-fed butter, a little bit of coconut oil, a little bit of saturated fats from high quality meats, of, of course, is definitely uh, there's nothing wrong with that especially since they also contain a lot of other health benefits let's go with the high quality red meats for instance they also have so much iron vitamin b etc that you will benefit from but um, nonetheless it shouldn't mean that you should go overboard on those now when it comes to the monos and moni, mono unsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats we are getting to the ones that we want to have more of the healthy fats on average. But even amongst those, there are some that we want to have more of and others that we do want to limit just because they are so present in our normal day-to-day -day life and therefore we're probably consuming a bit too much from them. So the monounsaturated fats that we want to have more of, the omega-3s particularly, are from um, extra virgin olive oil, but also present in nuts and seeds and avocados and flax seeds and egg yolk, etc. And then in the polyunsaturated fats, that's the, the one that we really, really, really want to have the most of will be omega-3. That's why I do recommend supplementing with omega-3 for almost everybody. It's especially the omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA, which we want to have more of, not so much the ALA, which is the plant Based, uh, or the 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 omega three fatty acids that's usually found in yeah flax seeds and algae and so on. The reason for that is not that that would be not as um that there would be anything wrong with the fatty acid itself. Is that your body can't really use it so much and it needs to be transcribed to DHA and AL and, and EPA anyway, and that transcription process by the body is very inefficient and only about 20% of that actually end up being beneficial to the, to the body if at all if if that much so we might as well just supplement with DHA and EPA to begin with um omega 3 uh, omega 6s are also part of the polyunsaturated fats so technically people would say like oh why don't we have more of those and that's especially when that whole movement towards um more of the canola oil, so soybean oil, and um, all grapeseed oil and, and whatever came about. However, now we know that actually in our, it should be our goal to have um, almost 
an a balance of one to one when it comes to omega-3 to omega-6 that would be like the dream even a balance of one omega-3 per four omega-6s would be absolutely amazing unfortunately in most people the balance looks more like 1 to 20 and therefore we really don't need to try to increase the content of omega-6s in our diet on the contrary we want to lower that especially because a lot of these um, plant-based oils are highly processed and actually in the format that they arrive or that we consume them nowadays are not that beneficial for our body anymore so if you take something away from this healthy fat section it's making sure you consume enough healthy fats it's minimizing trans fats or processed things, um, frozen things, and so on. And, well, not necessarily frozen, you know, if you buy a normal purchase, a normal, normal steak frozen, that's fine, but more like frozen pizza and all these ready made meals. Um, still consuming saturated fats in moderation and um, really going down on the. Um, omega, the, the omega 9s and omega 3s, particularly extra virgin olive oil. Um, and fish oil so healthy fatty fish like salmon mackerel sardines etc they're incredibly beneficial for your uh, hormone health now point number three is optimizing your training to help your hormones this was a point that i had a really 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 hard time to learn <laughs> because I found CrossFit and I just loved it. And while CrossFit has some really, really great foundations in the sense of getting people to strength train and the sense of mobility and having just a well-rounded fitness, I am a very competitive person. So I just took it way too far <laughs> and overdid it. There were days when I was doing two a day trainings. There were days when, you know, I'd had three hours of sleep and still I would just absolutely hammer my nervous system. And that combination really drove my hormones down the drain I it turned to a point where I was having kind of like mental health struggles I almost felt a little bit depressed I'm, I'm a very very positive person normally and so getting to a point where I wake up and I'm like oh what am I even doing here this you know it wouldn't be the end of the world if it were wouldn't be the worst thing if 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 I wasn't here tomorrow kind of thing that was a bit of an eye-opener for me and um in any case what I want to say with this is that some forms of training are just too stressful for our life circumstances and for us individually. The tolerance is incredibly different from person to person. Some people have a higher stress tolerance than others. The um, when it comes to volume, but also just the intensity. But we don't, we shouldn't underestimate that throughout the various stages in our lives, this is likely going to change also. So, you know, if something worked for you when you were in your early 20s, you had fun with it and you saw some great initial results with it and so on, doesn't mean that 10 years later when you have a family, when you have high work stress and, um, you know, your body has kind of gotten overtrained, that it's still the best method. It might still be fun. <laughs> and that was a really hard point for me to grasp as well, because during the training, I had so much fun. And even afterwards, you know, when you get that adrenaline rush and you think, oh, I gave it all, I left it all on the floor. And that whole mentality of harder is better and, you know, go and crush it. And if you're not sweating, then you're not working out right. And I was so bought into that. And it was not until I was actually forced to take a break and because I had some injuries, neck, wrist, lower back, that um, I recognized that for body composition and for health, it was actually much better if I reduced my training volume, if I just trained more intentionally, thinking about what do I actually want to get out of this? Well, I mostly want to look good. Okay, so why am I doing... A lot of things that don't actually help with that. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, of course, recognizing that more is not always better when it comes to, um, so not just the intensity, but when it comes to frequency as well, so that I didn't have to train seven times a week and maybe four times was just as great. And I didn't need to be in there for two hours, but like 45 minutes to an hour was plenty. So that is basically what I mean by training better, reassessing like what's your actual goal. If your goal is health or, health or aesthetics, you do not need to hammer yourself 
every single training session or most training sessions actually every now and then pushing the limits going hard i'm not saying that in your strength training you shouldn't go hard but just that combination of a lot of high intensity work of overdoing it in addition to a lot of other lifestyle factors probably not the best thing and this is, doesn't just apply to me i have had numerous clients that have come from more or less a similar crossfit addiction <laughs> or other high intensity sport addiction and we slowly transferred them into more of a functional strength training with maybe in the beginning the occasional group workout or whatever uh, or maybe even uh, a small metcon at the end but much more structured without the weights not as um much of an emphasis on ex 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 eccentric load, etc. Um, and they saw incredible body composition changes. They managed to sleep better. That was often one of the biggest things that people say, like, wow, I've slept through the night. I didn't need to go to the bathroom five times, which is often an indicator that there is something wrong with your hormones overall. So yes, when it comes to your training, assess if what you're doing is actually matching up with your goals. And if you're also compensating some of these high stressors with things that activate your parasympathetic nervous system. So for instance, if you have a hard training, training session afterwards, are you making sure that you're giving your body the chance to calm down again? Are you doing a little bit of meditation or breath work or simply going for a walk to help you relax with that? And I was even at a place where I was like, I can't even just do like regular yoga. It's way too boring. And yet alone thinking of meditation at the time was just like, are you joking? <laughs> That's for hippies, you know, I'm not going to do that. And then I slowly leaned into it and just learned more and more about it and heard that most successful people actually have some downtime and ways where they learn to relax and where they are no longer afraid to just be with themselves and with their thoughts, which like truth be told, that's probably oftentimes why people avoid silence why people avoid um you know sitting there with their with their thoughts we always have the need of oh, i need to do something <laughs> otherwise we're if we're not feeling productive then you know what what the heck are we actually doing with our lives and that's so backwards so just my reminder here moving on to step number four which is minimizing the three p's in your environment the three p's here stand for plastic pesticides and parabens so these environmental um, or these these chemicals here have the ability to mimic your hormones. If they are in our, our environment and they permeate through our skin, get into our body, and we have excessive amounts of them, they will essentially mess with your hormone levels. So picture this. You have a certain amount of, let's just take uh, estrogen or whatever in your body. And the estrogen is meant to dock onto certain receptors to send a message to this receptor from the brain. Now, you might be touching a lot of plastic. You have all the commercial skincare and cleaning products. So these chemicals go through your, permeate through your skin and float around your bloodstream, pretending to be estrogens, docking onto these receptors causing the actual estrogen to remain in your bloodstream just floating around because they don't have any receptors to dock onto anymore. That means you now suddenly have excess estrogen levels messing with your overall hormone profile. Ho hopefully that picture sort of made sense. So why, why, what, do I, what do I mean with plastic pesticides and parabens? So pesticides um, obviously are, is, is the stuff that our, a lot of um, our crop is sprayed with. It very much depends what you're eating or what crop, crop we're talking about when it comes to the quantities. You can head over to the website of the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, where they release every single year a list of the dirty dozen, so the 12 foods or types of produce which are most heavily laden with pesticides that you should purchase organic. They also release a list of 15 foods, the clean 15, which you really do not need to purchase organically because they hardly um, absorb any of these pesticides. So I find that list really, really helpful when it comes to managing your savings or managing your spendings um, because we don't need to 
purchase everything organically is a lot of people are on a budget and I'm a very cheap person as well. I always try to save where I can. So um, that's definitely a place to look into. And um, on, on top of that, though, I do want to mention that eating some conventional vegetables and fruit, washing them well, etc., cooking them well is probably or is still better than not eating vegetables at all so if you are on a budget and you don't want to purchase vegetables organically it's still better that way and risking having slightly more of a pesticide consumption than if you don't eat them so <laughs> that's just one note there now parabens are in a lot of um or almost all commercial skincare and cleaning products. So your lotion, your makeup, etc. And that's something that we can actually very easily avoid. I know that they're not necessarily the pro organic products are not necessarily the products that are uh, advertised in our in the media or that are appeal super sexy. Um, nonetheless, that nowadays there are actually a lot of great skincare companies that also also like the product smells nice it actually does what it says it's not just shampoo that leaves your hair feeling like straw and so on so slowly next time you run out of something just make the effort of purchasing it uh, or repurchasing it organically and plastic is very difficult to eliminate in our environment unfortunately and um, but just paying more attention to plastic bags and that's not just in the sense of recycling i mean more like what you touch as well, plastic bags, your the the water or your shaker bottles, um, if you have any um, plastic coffee coffee cups and so on, all that it seems so tiny, but it really does add up. Point number five is something that has become more popular in recent years, I want to say, and that is getting a regular amount of daylight exposure. I'm saying daylight exposure because sunlight is not always accessible for a lot of people, especially in the winter time. Um, so we do want to get that regular daylight exposure, ideally within like an hour or two after waking and ideally again in the afternoon or evening before the sun goes down. Um, but the morning one really is the most important one to help your circadian rhythm also. And that's really the thing that I struggled the most with, with working night shifts and so on, having just that completely messed up circadian rhythm on top of everything else. <laughs> um, on the note of sunlight or daylight exposure, though, we do need to mention vitamin D, which is actually technically not a vitamin, but a hormone and very much involved in or connected with the other hormones such as testosterone as well. So especially if it's, if you do go through a period where it's winter for you, or if um, uh, you just generally aren't a person that is outside a lot. I highly recommend vitamin D supplementation for most people. And uh, this is something that you can get or probably should get checked in the form of blood test as well, just to see your levels. But actually, I mean, a lot of the doctors um, often just prescribe about 1000 international units when there is actually so much evidence that that is not even or sometimes just sufficient to get to the baseline yet like very very far from being optimal and there are studies where people have supplemented with as much as 10,000 international units and they were absolutely fine with that so I while I definitely wouldn't go quite as high unless you live like in the deepest darkest winter of Canada for instance <laughs> um, I would probably say most people are fine or can tolerate something between three and five thousand international units that's just a recommendation here now, of course, um, as I mentioned, circadian rhythm, moving into step number six, which is optimizing sleep and your stress overall. Sleep is sounds like it's easier to manage than the stress. I always um, encourage people to have not just an alarm in the morning, but also a bedtime alarm where it's like their initiation to start getting ready because we often just think like, okay, I need to set my alarm at this and that time, but we don't really count backwards. Okay, I want to be in bed or have a sleep opportunity for about eight hours. That means I need to be asleep or be in bed at this and that time. That means I need to start getting ready about 30 minutes prior. That means I should put my phone away about 30 minutes prior. So just work your way backwards in order to determine when you should be going to bed. Um, oftentimes people struggle falling asleep as well. So here I would recommend something like brain dumping and just having a little journal or so where you write things in 
to not maybe not like right before you go to sleep otherwise it's still so fresh on your mind but maybe as you finish off your work day or as you have tucked in the kids just writing out what was on your mind or what's up next for, for the next day so that you don't have to carry it any longer in your mind of course we have all these other supplements that we can um, take in order to help with sleep such as magnesium um, and, and many others which I don't necessarily want to get into in detail in this episode but I would highly recommend if you are someone who enjoys reading or even just podcast listening audiobook listening and um, to listen to Matthew Walker's um, audiobook which is called why we sleep or read it of course and um, and he basically lays out so so nicely and so much in detail why sleep is so important and if you are someone who thinks oh no I'm not affected by a lack of sleep I get by with five or six hours just fine which so many people including myself do or like I used to think that and um, he says that there is actually very clear evidence that this is only the case for about two percent of the population and the rest of us really do need seven hours of sleep in order to function optimally not saying necessarily to function <laughs> you might be getting by just fine but and also more more importantly for longevity right like your sleep is when we restore so many processes in our body so sleep and stress management is the probably more difficult one but here the thing that i just want to mention is that yes of course practices like meditation going for walks and so on are very helpful as i said i have had to learn to embrace those as well i was never the person that was naturally interested or even quote unquote good at that <laughs> i used to get bored incredibly quickly and just think like oh what a waste of time but it it improves and over time you really start seeing the benefits of it most importantly you start seeing you start focusing more on the things that you can control and letting go of the things that you cannot which again sounds so cheesy but it's really really true and the other thing that i have found incredibly helpful is just learning more about my breath and how i can use that to manipulate my body even just in the sense of heart rate calming myself down etc so i would focus on those things in addition to of course learning to say no more often <laughs> which i will refer you to uh, one of my previous episodes where i talked about how to get better at saying no because that of course can eliminate a lot of stress now lastly and this is something newer and i will admit that i am not very um consequential with that or i don't do it very often unfortunately but there's a lot of positive research or great research on the benefits of heat or cold exposure um on hormones as well so for instance going to the sauna once a week taking a cold shower in the morning ice baths and so on we do need to consider the timing of those when it comes to exercise like taking a cold plunge right after your exercise not advised because then you're kind of diminishing the effects from your training however if you were to train in the morning and then you did or other way around if you were to do cold plunge in the morning and then you went and trained in the afternoon that's probably a great sequence and then maybe once a week or so go into the sauna for 20 30 minutes and with a break in between <laughs> just to get yourself sweating so essentially we do i think a, a, a light here or what we can exp how we can explain the mechanism here is that a stressor a certain stressor on your body is good so that it tries to adapt to that stressor and get more resilient but if we overstress it then it's going to have a negative effect on the hormones, especially if it's a long-term stress. And for most people, you know, once you establish a habit, it it just, you carry on with that and it, it accumulates. And so if you overtrain, you it usually just gets worse. If you eat poorly, it usually just gets worse. Like unless we pay attention to something like that, it doesn't improve on its own. So the seven steps, once again, were eating the right amount of calories, eating the right amount of fats and the right the right fats then the third step is optimizing your training in order to support your hormones fourth step is looking into the three p's in your environment so going through your cupboards going through your cleaning products and skin care and um, really purchasing your vegetables or produce mindfully step number five is to get the right kind of daylight exposure and looking into your vitamin d levels step number six sleep and stress management and then step number seven 
potentially adding heat or cold exposure. That's my little bonus there. And I'm probably just saying that because I'm not doing too well on that myself. <laughs> Shame on me. Uh, I hope you found these steps helpful. If you have any questions about this episode, hormones in general, or anything pertaining to nutrition training, or even just me personally, please feel free to contact me. I always like to hear from you guys. And of course, I hope you will tune in again to the next episode next week. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, or share the episode on social. Very much appreciated. You can also follow us on Instagram at Nutrition Coaching and Life or head to our website, www.nutritioncoachingandlife.com, where we provide more valuable content. Have a wonderful day. Now go out and work on your best self.